Hello, and thank you for joining today's visioning discussion for the Tacoma Tide Flat subarea plan. I'm Marcy Wagner from the consultant team, and I'll be moderating today's session. The previous two discussions were focused on land use and economic development, and the second on environment and health. Today's discussion is focused on transportation and infrastructure. As a reminder, <clears throat> this meeting will also be recorded and posted to the city's YouTube channel, as are the prior two sessions. Before we begin, this land recognition was developed in collaboration with tribal staff. I'd like to read it before we proceed. Let us acknowledge that this project is being conducted on the historical and current home lands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. <clears throat> Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, and gathered in the Tacoma Tide Flats, and they retain these rights to this day. Let us take this moment to recognize the unique responsibility in being co-stewards with the tribe over these lands and waters and work with them to safeguard their treaty protected rights. In a few moments, we'll invite the panelists to introduce themselves, then hear a project overview by a member of the project management team followed by our panel discussion. After each panel discussion, we'll invite our audience to submit questions using the Zoom Q&A feature. We also have an online survey available at cityoftacoma.org slash tideflats if you'd like to share your thoughts that way as well. The project management team for the Tacoma Tide Flat Subarea Plan, <clears throat> excuse me, is composed of representatives from each of the participating agencies and the Puyallup Tribe. The representatives are Steve Atkinson from the City of Tacoma, Steve Frittle from the City of Fife, Sean Gaffney from Pierce County, Andrew Strobel from the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, and Deirdre Wilson from the Port of Tacoma. The consultant team includes myself and Rebecca Fornaby, Deborah Monkberg, and Radha Kinnair, both of whom you will hear from later since they will be managing questions from the audience. I'd like to, actually, I should also mention Steve Atkinson will be doing the presentation today, the overview presentation. I'd like to thank our panelists for participating in today's discussion about the vision for the Tide Flats future from a transportation perspective. We'll also have Steve Atkinson from the project team to respond to questions regarding infrastructure. I'll now invite the panelists to introduce themselves and their organization, starting with Josh Diekman. So Josh. Good morning, thank you, Marshall. My name is Josh Diekman. I'm the city traffic engineer for Tacoma. Thank you. Darren Stavish. Good morning or good afternoon. Darren Stavish, principal planner for Pierce Transit. Great, thank you. Christine Wolf. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Christine Wolf. I'm the transportation planner for both the Port of Tacoma and the Northwest Seaport Alliance. Excellent. Thank you. Karen Zima. Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Zima. I'm the Vice President of Field Operations for the West Coast for Road One Intermodal Logistics, and I'm also the current uh, president under the Washington Trucking Association intermodal carrier conference and that makes up the trucking community that is servicing uh, the Pacific Northwest Gateway in North Harbor and South Harbor. Great, thank you. And now I'm going to turn 
over the meeting to Steve Atkinson to do an overview presentation about the project. Steve. Great, thank you very much. I'm Stephen Atkinson. I'm a principal planner with the City of Tacoma's Long Range Planning Division. Um, really excited to be here today and, and provide this overview presentation. I will just say at the beginning, it's always uh, a little difficult when you're, you're giving the transportation overview when you've got all of the transportation experts in the room on the panel today. So really looking forward to hearing from them, uh, but happy to provide a little bit of background information as well as we get started. Um, and as Marcy said, the, the topic today is uh, uh, transportation and infrastructure. So I'll be providing a little bit of an overview of each of those, while the panel discussion will be predominantly focused on the transportation side. Um, so this first slide is, is really just sort of helping set the stage that when we talk about visioning, we're recognizing we're not starting from a blank slate in the tide flats. Uh, it's an area that really sits sort of at the fulcrum of you know, our natural environment, our economic life, as well as the social and cultural life of this community. So there's a lot of values that we place on this area. There's a lot of ways that we as a community uh, and really as a region really rely on this area. And so as we start this planning process, we're seeking really to try to identify ways that we can uh, really respect these different values and the different contributions that the Tide Flats makes to our community. Um, in terms of the project goals, and I think this is a, a kind of a good point to kind of clarify again, kind of where we're at in this process. So we have um, a process we are undertaking as a collaborative joint planning process uh, among the city of Tacoma, Port of Tacoma, Puyallup Tribe of Indians, Pierce County, and the city of Fife. Um, as part of that uh, joint planning, we have goals that we've established as a, as a project team, um, as gov governments collaborating together. Uh, so one of those kind of key goals for us as, as part of this process is to really develop this work collaboratively, really be working together jointly from, from really from day one, uh, and really embarking on a kind of planning process we haven't really done before. I think is really unique, uh, both in the city of Tacoma, as well as in the region. Uh, and so the, the intent of that, oh, sorry, <laughs> go back one more slide. I just want to say just a, a couple other just statements on this slide. So there, um, one of the key goals for this then is, is really trying to make sure that, that through this joint planning effort, that at the end of the day, that we have a much greater understanding of the perspectives that each of the governments bring to the table. Um, and that we really start to, to develop a joint goal and joint vision for this area so that over the next 20 or 30 years, we, we have a really good understanding of our priorities, what we're trying to accomplish and a path to get there. And then as we kind of then turn to the rest of this process, I want to just point out that this doesn't mean that we didn't have every outcome kind of ironed out at this stage, that the input that we will get from you all through this visioning process will then help articulate some of the, the strategies and the specific goals and outcomes that we're really looking for for this area over the next uh, coming decades. Um, and <clears throat> So what's, uh, what's on the table? And I think this is uh, kind of a, a great uh, kind of starting point for the kinds of questions that we're gonna be grappling with through this process. So we understand we have a globally competitive port that plays a really significant role in our region's economy. We're a, and have been a very trade dependent state. Uh, we also recognize that we have some challenges that we're gonna be facing uh, over the coming decades uh, resulting from climate change and sea level rise. And that kind of on our own, it is very difficult to be able to respond to those challenges unless we're really all working together and coordinating that response. Um, secondly, we wanna kind of recognize and acknowledge that we are in an urban complex environment. We are in an industrial environment, uh, but we still wanna make sure that we have healthy salmon and shellfish populations. So we still have healthy orca populations that you can have in the coming decade. Um, likewise, uh, when we think about the Tide Plus, we want to ensure that we have a safe environment for our employees, for the people that work there, for the people that, that recreate there, as well as the neighborhoods around it. There's a lot of ways, again, that we want to explore this through this process, some of these questions, and seek win-win solutions. As I mentioned in the beginning, we're at the at sort of the visioning phase of this process. So I think many of the folks in the audience today are listening in, have probably been following this process uh, as we've kind of slowly built to this point over the last couple of years. Um, and we are still kind of at a phase here where we're talking pretty big picture about what we want to accomplish, the challenges that we're facing over the coming years. Um, and this is a phase where we are, you know, really looking for your input um, and your thoughts on what that future and that future vision could look like. 
And kind of following this meeting, we did have a, um, uh, we will be posting these uh, videos and discussions on our website. And we do have um, other opportunities for engagement, uh, both within um, uh, the next couple of months, but also following this as we start to then enter into the development of the future development alternatives, as well as the EIS scoping period. So right now what we're looking for from from our community, our thoughts on what those future goals and vision might look like. As we enter that scoping phase, what we're really then starting to think about are the kinds of questions like, what kinds of impacts do we need to be studying? What are some of the things that we do or don't know about our current environment or how um, use and development may impact our environment over time? And that'll be more of a, an informative stage as we start to do some of the more rigorous analysis of the kinds of impact we may expect over time. Um, and I think this is a, another uh, just sort of great, great slide in terms of kind of setting uh, some of the expectations as we move forward for visioning and goal development and future alternatives that while we uh, first kind of recognize that we're starting from an environment that has a lot of different uh, existing economic uses, um, existing infrastructure, existing transportation systems, uh, we're also working within a planning framework in Washington state that is layered and complex. Um, so local planning in Washington state isn't uh, entirely up to local jurisdictions. We, we get to tailor um, state policy and regional policy uh, to fit our community, but we do have some guideposts that we need to follow. And so these are a few of those guideposts, the, um, you know, the protected treaty rights that we mentioned earlier of the PL tribe. We have a state growth management act and shoreline management act. Uh, the port of Tacoma has its own, uh, I always say RCWs, but it's really, sort of state laws that govern kind of what port districts uh, can do and what their goals are. Um, and likewise, we work within a region uh, with funding that comes through the regional, the Puget Sound Regional Council. And there are planning requirements that we have with the, the Puget Sound Regional Council as well. So, so part of this process is balancing both what our community wants, how our vision uh, kind of gets framed for the future, but also balancing that with these other obligations that we have uh, with the state PL tribe, um, as well as with the regional council. And then um, uh, over the next few slides, I'll just touch on a few of the kind of key components of our existing transportation system. And uh, if anyone here goes to visit the website, take the online survey, uh, one thing to point out is that you'll see uh, kind of through the story map, uh, some links to the existing conditions report. And, and today I'll just, as I get started on this, just want to make note that uh, we have draft existing conditions reports uh, on the website uh, integrated in with that survey um, and we really welcome uh, anyone who wants to kind of read through that if there are things that you think that we're missing things that you think we should be considering uh, please uh, reach out and provide that information as well um, so that i think the big picture on this slide is really that transportation in the tide flats is very complicated uh, in many parts of the city what we're really looking at are some very defined priorities. Um, you know, we have streets throughout the city where it's really a pedestrian focus, and that's really the, the number one priority. Um, in the tide flats, it's a much more complicated picture. Um, so in terms of freight, um, normally with the transportation study, freight is kind of one of the last things to mention. We, we often, like in our downtown, we're looking at pedestrian access, pedestrian walkability, we're looking at transit service kind of first and foremost. Um, in the tide flats, you know, freight is one of the really the, the kind of key first components that we're looking at uh, from a transportation standpoint. And I think it's also great to, to kind of make note at this point that land use and transportation are really inextricably linked uh, with the freight network. So the infrastructure built to serve um, uh, shipping and rail um, also really connect to other modes of transportation. Uh, as land uses change, uh, obviously then there's different demands that can change over time um, on our transportation system. So our, our study as part of the subway plan is really gonna pre predominantly focus on the land side transportation, uh, which includes street and highway networks as well as, well as the rail network. Um, and there are a number of key connections through this area, including 40, 54th Avenue Northeast, Portscoma Road, uh, Portland Avenue, um, and let's see, and then SR 509 and I-705, obviously. Uh, so then in the future, the extension of SR 167 is one of the other major projects uh, that we expect from Puyallup uh, to SR 509. That's expected to become one of the primary connections to the Tide Flats. Uh, 
Um, the roadway network is also shaped by topography. And so in this case, in the tide flats, uh, what that really means are the waterways. I mean, so it's a, it's a flat area, but it's really dominated by the waterways uh, that run through the area. So we have uh, limited overwater connections and currently the 11th Street Bridge uh, is closed. Uh, and so east-west travel across the tide flats between downtown and northeast Tacoma uh, is, is a little bit more limited. Uh, within the core of the industrial area, there can be conge congestion, but it's smaller scale and typically tied to specific land uses and time periods. Um, it's also a unique environment. Again, there's uh, more significant truck queuing, uh, which can spill onto the public rights of way. Um, and that the port has developed off street waiting areas as one solution for their facilities to address that, that queuing. Uh, it's also an area with significant aggregated rail crossings that can create points of conflict between rail um, and auto and truck traffic. Um, and then uh, rail or any other type of blocking incident in this area can have sub, you know, substantial uh, traffic impacts because there are a few alternate routes uh, through the area. Um, the other thing I, I just make note of here at the end that Tide, flag, tide Flats is of critical importance to the military as well. Um, so we have, obviously have Joint Base Lewis McCord nearby um, and the Department of Defense has designated um, some key strategic highway networks in the event of a national emergency. Uh, the Tide Flats is also served by two uh, transcontinental railroads, uh, Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, uh, both of which have uh, mainline connections uh, here in the Tide Flats. Uh, we also have local switching provided by Tacoma Rail, which is a division of T Tacoma Public Utilities. Uh, and Tacoma Rail uh, provides, uh, let's see, uh, performs all local moves between uh, the uh, Union Pacific and Burlington Northern. Uh, rail with uh, local businesses, uh, including the Port of Tacoma and Northwest Seaport Alliance terminals and intermodal yards. Um, there are also four large intermodal yards where cargo is transferred to truck or ship, and about 40 businesses have direct rail connections with sidings or separate rail yards. And as I mentioned, that one of the things you can see on this map are the nearly 50 aggregate rail crossings uh, with local streets in the area. Now, in terms of um, transit in this area. We, we do have kind of adjacent to the manufacturing industrial center. We have the Tacoma Dome Station, which does provide really the city's richest hub uh, for uh, commuter rail with the link, uh, the bus station with all the uh, bus routes that connect uh, both locally and regionally. Uh, we also have uh, the planned Portland Avenue Station, uh, which is part of uh, in the kind of the still in the initial planning stages. Um, which would be located in, uh, along Portland Avenue in the Manufacturing Industrial Center. That creates another unique opportunity to consider kind of how that uh, interfaces with uh, freight and with the uh, kind of the core uses within the Manufacturing Industrial Center. Um, some of the key projects, uh, uh, for the future kind of looking at uh, how investment may change land use and transportation and potentially uh, how we can address some of the first last mile connection challenges for employees in this area. Now, uh, in terms of active transportation, uh, sidewalks are more prevalent outside the industrial area, uh, less so within the industrial area itself. Where they do exist, there are some issues with connectivity um, or substandard condition or width and ADA compliance. Those are things that we'll be looking at through this planning process. Um, the, the bike network uh, is a mix of striped lanes, multi-use trails, and wide shoulders. Um, and then obviously, we, we also have the, you know, the bike and active transportation network can provide uh, both a, a commute trip reduction, you know, an alternate mode of, of getting to work. Uh, it can also facilitate recreation. And we have under the Shoreline Management Act, some uh, guidance and planning already in place on providing shoreline public access and recreation. Uh, so our active transportation uh, networks can really facilitate a pretty broad range of, of public benefits and uh, address different public needs. Um, for parking, there's uh, typically sort of two main user groups, uh, general purpose vehicles. Uh, there's generally enough supply between on and off street spaces in the industrial area. Uh, for large trucks, parking is more limited. There's a high demand for overnight parking uh, within this area. Uh, Tide Flats is one of the few uh, areas really within the city that allows on street commercial vehicle parking. I think kind of recognizing kind of the uniqueness and the unique businesses um, and needs in this area. And I'm going to try to go a little bit more quickly. It's already 1220, so I want to make sure we get a lot of time for the panel. 
Uh, so just very quickly on uh, safety, uh, we are taking a look at uh, collision data from uh, uh, Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, and this heat map that we have here kind of shows where we have some of the highest concentrations uh, of collisions uh, within this area, which tend to be kind of along the periphery in the south. Uh, the darker purple indicates more crashes. The red dots are the serious, more serious injuries and fatalities. So there's definitely a higher concentration um, and higher volume uh, on roadways, particularly where they intersect. Um, and the concentration is lower within the manufacturing industrial center where speeds and volumes are lower. Um, and then obviously, so as we start to think ahead, um, some of the key questions for transportation as we move forward in some of the next phases of the, the planning process are how can we enhance critical corridors to improve freight and people mobility and access? We want to, uh, transportation improvements, uh, what, are, what transportation improvements are needed to support potential land use changes? And how will the network uh, evolve with the light rail extension? Um, and then finally, um, how can we maintain mobility if the gateway project is delayed? Um, now, in terms of infrastructure, um, I'll be fairly quick on this. Um, uh, infrastructure in this area, so beyond transportation, what we're typically talking about are utilities, water, wastewater, stormwater, and power um, are kind of the key components. Uh, most of those are, are provided uh, publicly through Tacoma Public Utilities, but there are some private utilities as well. Um, so the uh, first uh, utility we'll talk about are water. And, and just sort of on this point, when we're thinking about infrastructure at this stage, um, one of the key questions that we're really thinking about first is, so what are the forecasts that we already have in place today? And do we have sufficient capacity for these utilities to meet those, uh, those forecasts? Now, as we go through this process, some of those forecasts may change, um, and we'll need to evaluate capacity uh, to support the development that we're really seeking through this process uh, as we continue. Um, but based on existing information, uh, water uh, has sufficient capacity through 2060. Uh, wastewater uh, has uh, expected uh, capacity to meet projected growth through 2040, and there's no specific wastewater deficiencies or planned projects at this time. Um, similarly, with uh, stormwater, uh, in this area, about 85% of it is uh, impervious surface, uh, which includes roadways, roofs, and parking lots. Um, the stormwater runoff generated uh, from those surfaces uh, created by urban development is typically of a higher volume than what occurs in a pre-developed state. Uh, the stormwater is conveyed through the watershed primarily by both public and private underground conveyance systems, um, as well as through some stormwater ditch systems, including Wapato Creek and Northern Avenue Ditch. And then for power, um, hydropower makes up about 85% of the power source uh, with lesser amounts from nuclear, wind, biomass, solar, and others. Uh, needed improvements to the electrical system include expansion of distribution substations and replacement of aging facilities. Uh, capital funding has been appropriated through 2024 for general plant, power generation, power management, um, and other technology services. Uh, we also have a couple things to note here. The Port of Tacoma aims to reduce seaport-related air emissions. Uh, continued uh, electrification, including uh, uh, ship, uh, I would probably say this incorrectly, but ship to shore uh, power at the berths um, is also a, a really key early focus of electrification. And Tacoma Power and the Port are in those early stages of planning and expanding those uh, systems. All right, so with that, um, hopefully <laughs> it didn't take too long. Um, covered a lot of the key basics, but I'd be happy to hand it back now to the panel uh, for conversation and discussion. Great. Thank you, Steve. We have uh, two questions for the panel, and the first question actually has two parts. And that is, with respect to transportation and infrastructure, what is the biggest opportunity you see in the Tide Flats area, and what is a significant barrier to achieving that opportunity? I'm going to start with Karen, and then I think go to Darren, Josh, and then close with Christine on this particular question, just to give you a little time to think about it. So Karen, 
So thank you, Marcy. Um, so if I understand the question, uh, opportunities for transportation infrastructure and then some of the greatest um, barriers to that opportunity? Correct. Okay, thank you. Always hard going first. Um, yes, it so, is. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, in regards to transportation infrastructure, um, the shortfalls right now just really is the infrastructure, um, the roads and the uh, connections and uh, the 11th Avenue overpass, um, just um, reinforcing and the plans for improvements to the existing roads. I think um, the existing road system is uh, works very well. I ride and drive throughout the Tide Flats uh, frequently, almost daily. Um, so I think we've got a good mapping of, of what's in place, but the improvements to those roads and then the access uh, for the overpasses and improvements uh, for some of the areas for the rail, um, because we do have at times uh, the critical importance of our uh, railroads within the tide flats to move containers in and out of the port operations. Um, so any overpasses that could alleviate any congestion or backups uh, and, and that opportunity there uh, for planning. So um, that would be my thoughts in regards to the infrastructure. Uh, challenges are just improvements to existing and opportunities uh, would be just for in those improvements and creating better access points uh, for the existing rail structure and areas around the port where overpasses might be uh, improved upon. And then in the event that there might be uh, a detour off of I-5 or uh, problems with uh, the highway system, uh, just good road structures so that any detours uh, can quickly move through the Tide Flats area and not cause any problems for the existing businesses, uh, retail or commercial. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So next we'll go to Darren. And again, if you could tell us from a transportation and infrastructure perspective, what's the biggest opportunity in the Tide Flats and what's the biggest barrier to achieving it? I don't know if I could speak to infrastructure being a transit planner, but I can uh, answer from a, a transit perspective, obviously. For us, um, I think the biggest challenge is always funding um, however, I'm excited as uh, we get through the pandemic and things kind of open up again and, and people start considering transit as a viable option. What we're hearing in Washington and reading uh, what's going on nationwide is that ridership is not the most important thing anymore. So it doesn't have to be the number of people, uh, packed buses and packed rail cars anymore are not going to be the new norm. And I think it's exciting for us because if you're not basing it just on productivity or how many riders per hour, how many riders per route, but looking at new areas that were not served before, such as the port and Ruston Way and, and areas that have always been a challenge for us, we're, we're looking at things, I think, through a whole new lens and it's exciting. And there, there's, I can't share anything yet because they're still kind of in the um, gestation sa stages, but we're certainly going to be looking at the runner service. I don't know if you can I got a bad light in here at the PT runner. It's actually a piercetransit.org forward slash runner is on our website. And this was an on-demand service that um, was introduced last year to serve um, Ruston Way, uh, Point Ruston Development. It's going to be extended to go into the Tide Flats as well when it's reintroduced um, in the next couple of months. And we're also looking at a couple of new fixed routes to serve the port that, it, that didn't exist before. Uh, one of the, the nice things about being a rubber tire transit provider is we're nimble and quick, so we can introduce things very quickly, uh, un, unlike uh, steel on steel rail infrastructure, which is very expensive and, you know, takes, takes years or decades to plan and, and implement. So I, I think there's going to be some exciting things coming from us very soon. Unfortunately, I'm not quite in a position to reveal, but I think when we all, by the time this process is done, I think I'm going to have some very exciting and positive news for not only the team, but the public we serve as far as a new new service in, in the port, uh, both again uh, on demand and, and fixed route is coming. Great, thank you. Interesting, the change in perspective about transit, about how you measure success with what it accomplishes. So that's an exciting prospect. Josh, what can you tell us in response to what's the biggest opportunity in the Tide Flats? and the barrier to achieving that. 
Thank you. I think in the, in the big picture, one of the strengths we certainly have is the partnership of all of the agencies that have a strong interest in the Tide Flats area and all of the stakeholders and the, the collaboration among those agencies and stakeholders has historically led to a lot of success and not just doing the plans, but then pursuing funding for infrastructure improvements and examples being the Port of Tacoma Road Interchange and SR-167 Gateway that was mentioned earlier. Um, I see that that strength is one of the key opportunities for this area and for this planning effort. And so I'm hopeful that we will identify key infrastructure improvements that will support the economic vitality of the region and the state and also the land use vision for the area. From an infrastructure standpoint, one of the barriers that I see could be delay. Um, and so most major projects require, um, you know, funding was mentioned by Darren. Funding is always the, the biggest question in terms of implementing infrastructure. Most major projects require outside funding such as grants. And in most cases, multiple grants, and it takes years in many cases to bring together those funding sources to conduct those major projects. And the better job we do now at developing a shared vision for what we're pursuing, the more successful we'll be in making investment in the community. Great, thank you. And Christine. Thank you, Marcy. Um, I would echo what um, Josh just said. We've actually been working together collaboratively for many years and have been able to successfully implement projects. Um, from the port's perspective, of course, you know, uh, although it's not part of the planning process, the fact that we have a natural deep water port that has actually been in active use for thousands of years um, is, is a very, very large opportunity. And much of the existing infrastructure that we have today in the tide flats would probably not have been built without that without the water access and the ability to trade in the early days with all the Salish people along the West Coast and now actually with the rest of the world. So um, from my perspective, we already have a very well developed um, infrastructure system on, both on the water side and the land side. Um, that enables us to make a major contribution to the economy and the jobs and the quality of life in, in Tacoma and Pierce County and the region. And we want to be able to keep doing that, of course. Um, so from, from a challenge point of view, um, I, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here and have more than one answer. Um, one is, um, you know, there are, uh, a lot of folks who don't quite understand the asset that we have in the tide flats with this um, system of coordinated uh, elements of, of transportation infrastructure and, and what, what a treasure that is. A lot of folks uh, in other parts of the country or the world would envy us for what we already have. Um, Challenges, um, you know, as, as Josh was saying, you know, we've been able to, to work together collaboratively to get a lot of large projects done, but um, funding is getting increasingly more difficult to manage. There's just huge demands um, and we have to really work together to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what our joint priorities are and um, how we're going to approach those. Um, and if I just may make one point more, and that's um, Steve focused his conversation, his, his discussion early on, on 167 and finishing that, that's absolutely critical, but we also need to make sure that we build the second phase of the Port of Tacoma road and I-5 interchange because that actually has even more truck trips at least right now and we really need to make sure um, that that works and then of course the Fishing Wars Memorial Bridge um, which can handle large loads heavy loads right now and that really puts additional pressure on that intersection with I-5 on I-5 which is already heavily congested. And that's sort of the third point that I would like to make is that there's a, you know, 
we have a transportation system um, that works in the tight flats apart from the at grade rail crossings that Karen was talking about. But once we try to get off the tight flats, we are faced with a very heavily congested system and we often have trouble getting on that. So trying to figure out a way to not just think about the tight flats, but also making sure that we can connect to um, the city and the county and the rest of the region will be important. Thank you. So I heard, I believe that the basic infrastructure in the port area, including its natural deep water port, actually the basics of that function pretty well. The interface uh, going beyond has challenges. And I think the barrier I heard from everybody was funding. And so the essential nature of having teamwork amongst all the agencies being really critical to bringing all the pieces of the puzzle together in terms of funding for these major efforts. It sounds like some major infrastructure projects. Do you have any of you have additional thoughts about how you make that piece really successful? <laughs> I see smiles. <laughs> Anyone have thoughts? Karen? Pierce, yes. Um, I think Pierce County is doing an incredible job right now in the city of Tacoma and um, the uh, sub area plan and uh, the logistics planning cluster. There are so many efforts going on right now uh, to recognize, um, as Christine said, um, the jewel that we have in the tide flats and, and the access with the deep water access for the ports. Um, the infrastructure is currently strong and solid and uh, we do need to reinforce that. So we do need resources, revenue and funds. And I know that um, there's been a significant amount of money that is being uh, injected into the economy right now. And I know it's also being injected into the state of Washington. And I think that we need to speak to uh, all of our uh, government officials um, to access those funds and to apply them to current projects so we can get the current plot projects completed and then uh, look to fund uh, some of the longer term projects. But uh, there are revenues available in the state with the announcement that we are uh, strong at our budget numbers the other day, and uh, also with the injection of the uh, Re Recovery Act funds. So that would be my thought on that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Anyone else care to mention other thoughts? Well, Marsha, I just wanted to, uh, you probably saw this in the chat, there are three people standing by from the public that had questions, and I wanted mm -hmm. to not to take over the meeting, but to make sure that we allowed time to answer them since they were kind enough to participate. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I am going to turn to Radhika to help us with those questions from the audience. Or I guess it looks like Deborah. My mercy. Thanks. Um, yes, we wanted to um, offer up one of the questions um, that was from the, the uh, attendees. Um, and it has to do with bicycle and pedestrian circulation. And it was building off of the slide uh, that showed safety in the tide flats area. And, um, and then I want to tag on another question. The, the actual question is, how are bicycle and pedestrian injuries tracked on roadways in the tide flats? And that might be primarily for Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the second part is, how might we plan for safe bicycle and pedestrian access to the tide flats? So Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Mark. I, I'm very happy to take that question. And um, I'm going to kind of focus on what we can do through this process, although the city does track collisions that happen all throughout the city, including it in the tide flats. And the city also is working on plans such as the Vision Zero effort that's kicking off this year to address uh, particularly injury and um, or serious injury and fatality collisions in the city. But regarding this process, I think that um, one of the biggest needs that we have in the tide flats is making sure 
uh, that we are accommodating uh, the most vulnerable users such as pedestrians and bicyclists. And as Steve mentioned earlier, one of the things that's difficult about the tide flats, flats area is that there are some difficulties with mixing heavy freight and those more vulnerable users. And so just getting sidewalks along our roadways is one of the most obvious needs. Other needs are, as Steve noted, providing public access to the, the waterways. And although Steve didn't mention it, I think that one of the other things that um, we have a need to do is to connect Tacoma's downtown, not just to the Tide Flats, but to Northeast Tacoma and to Fife and to some of the regional trail connections in Fife and beyond, such as the Envision Tacoma to Puyallup Trail. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that question? Thank you, Josh. I think that covered the uh, question. And Deborah, are there others? Um, yes. Let's see. Um, there was a reference earlier, I think by Darren, about sort of the post-COVID era. And there was a question about sort of how do you think the tide flats will be impacted by changes in transportation patterns um, as we move out of the sort of quarantine pandemic period that we're in? And that's really a question for anyone. Um, I, I can I can start this one if that's okay. Sure. Um, I actually think that um, you know we we had a, a a drop in the freight volume that came through our our facilities early on during the pandemic, but it's gotten back up again and is actually. Um, we're processing more volume now than we have at the same time last year by about 20%. Um, and that's because everybody can't spend money on vacations and on, on fancy dinners and, and the movies and the theater. So people buy stuff and it comes through our facilities. So we actually have more truck traffic, or at least for now, than we had before. And other than that, I would just like to note that... Um, the vast majority of the jobs, except for folks who work in an office under normal circumstances like I do, most of the jobs in the tight flats are jobs where people have to be there to do their job. So in terms of the, the commute patterns, um, it actually hasn't changed hardly at all because you know our longshoremen folks have to operate the cranes the train crews have to run the trains and, and all the industrial businesses, um, the folks who work in production and maintenance, they have to be on the job to, to do what they need to do. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move on to our next question for the panelists, but I do wanna note that the questions that are being put in the Q&A, we will, uh, provide responses to those and get those posted. So we won't leave anyone out on those. So the next question is with respect to transportation and infrastructure, how does the tide flats from your perspective look 20 years from now? So I think I will go in reverse order this time and start again with Christine, then go to Josh Darren and Karen. So Christine. All righty. Um, so um, 20 years from now, the tight flats from my perspective will still be a place where we have the infrastructure that's necessary to continue to connect us with the rest of the world. We need that, we want that. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna make sure that it's there. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to do a better job um, in managing these assets and making sure that we move to a, a cleaner, um, cleaner way of doing business in the tight flats. And we need to make sure that we use what we have uh, more efficiently than, than we're able to do now. You know, we need to use technology to to improve um, operations because we cannot build our way out of it. That doesn't mean that I don't think that there are projects that need to get done. 
but the time of these very large infrastructure projects um, and many of them are gone. What we will need to do is make strategic investments and, and uh, improve and maintain what we have. Um, and you know that points to, to another element of what Steve was talking about earlier. It sounded like we're doing pretty well on, on water and stormwater and those kinds of things. But the, the, on the infrastructure side, the, the thing that we really need to work on collectively as well is power. Because if we want to clean our um, supply chain and the transportation use, uh, this is the use of the transportation system, the, the best uh, option we have right now is to electrify as much as we can. Um, and in order to do that, just on the transportation side, we'll need like 30% more power than we have right now. Um, and that's a tall order. So um, we need to connect those two. Thank you. Josh, again, the question, how does the Tide Flats look and function 20 years from now? Thank you. And, and some of this is a little bit speculative because that's what we're trying to get at through this process. But I think in the general sense, I think we can say that the Tide Flats um, the Tide Flats area in 20 years is going to have robust and better connected infrastructure that's in good condition and that's resilient and provides re better redundancy and better connections across barriers such as rivers and, and railways. Um, I, I think that um, this gets back to some of the comments that I made earlier that I think one of the most important things that we can do is identify that vision now so that we can keep working toward it over 20 years and in 20 years we can have implemented a, a large portion of that vision. Great, thank you. Darren, 20 years into the future, and it sounds like the future Josh just described with a better connected infrastructure in mm -hmm. the area might be a bonus to transit, particularly the rubber tired transit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, first and last mile connections, as you know, uh, transit only works when it's safe, fast, reliable, and accessible. And, and to our minds, I, I, my vision, I think personally for 20 years from now would be that you can get to jobs in the port or in the tide flats via transit. It's viable. It might not be a big bus. It might be a, a micro bus or something. One of the things that I've been reading in a lot of the literature from APTA, which is the American Public Transit Association, says that short trips, bus trips, are going to be much more prevalent in the future, that you might use transit for a mile, a couple miles, of half mile, uh, and, and you don't need a really big bus to do that. That's, again, more nimble. Um, I think uh, collectively with, with more bike and pedestrian access and that type of in infrastructure that makes, it, it, there's a synergy as you know. And, I, and, and the nice thing about those types of investments is they're a lot less expensive than a roadway or a highway. But um, I, it's, if, if it's there and if, if it, is, it is built and it is added to, uh, for that type of access, transit would definitely work. And I think it could work. And again, I go back to what I said at the beginning is it's, it's I don't, I think in the next, you know, two to three to five, 10 years, we're not going to be looking at least in the short term about ridership, packed buses, packed trains. Uh, it, it's all about productivity more so I think in the future, especially with the new administration and kind of the new vision coming out of the US DOT. Um, with Secretary Budasich is, is who, who are you serving and who, who did you not serve before via transit? So I hope that makes sense. It's, I, 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 see, I see a change in the dynamic and I think the timing of this group and the work that's going on through the city is, couldn't be more, uh, more on point. And timely. Yes, timely. Yeah. Thank you for saying yeah. that. I was missing the word. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. And Karen. What would you like to say about 20 years into the future? Thank you, Marcy, and agreed with the other panelists. And um, so I actually see an incredibly strong um, commercial and industrial uh, job and economic engine um, strengthened with all of the programs that we've been working on and are working on right now with the sub area plan. I see a, a tremendous opportunity for a strong 
uh, job creating area uh, for the gateway, uh, continued strengthening of the infrastructure. I, I think all of the programs for infrastructure and planning and the vision uh, for how the tide flats will be utilized and uh, put in a position to continue to be cleaner and greener. Uh, the Northwest Ports Clean Air Strategy is coming up for the phase three update. Uh, the port commissioners will be reviewing that phase three document, which takes us to zero emissions uh, within the marine terminal operations by 2020, excuse me, 2050. So we really have a lot of great things working right now and we're moving towards uh, improving uh, that will involve a cleaner and greener area around the tide flats area. But I think we continue to need to support the commercial and industrial uh, plans that we have, and then the transportation infrastructure projects to uh, move the freight in and out of the corridor quickly, efficiently, safely, uh, with less opportunity for accidents. So I just see a much, much stronger uh, engine uh, for Pierce County and the state of Washington as we continue through all these programs. So all a very good news story in, in my mind in 20 years. Great, thank you. And I am again going to turn to Deborah and see if she has questions to pose for the panel. Yeah, we do, Marcy, thank you. Um, we have a question related to sea level rise associated with climate change in the future. Um, sort of thinking a little longer term future uh, than we were just talking about, but that there have been ideas such as elevation of roads, uh, use of levees and a seawall or relocation of facilities. Um, should the plan that we're embarking on um, start to plan for those kinds of measures? And if so, uh, what should be considered and, and sort of what's the most important things to be thinking about now? Who would like to take that question or at least take it first. Karen, did I see your hand go up? Marcy, could you uh, repeat the question quickly um, and encapsulate it for me? I had a little bit of a difficult time hearing the complete question. Please, I'm gonna ask Deborah to do so again. Yeah. Sure, it was a question about sea level rise in the tide flats. And uh, there's a lot of different options for how that might be handled. Um, and should the plan that we're embarking on start to think about those measures? And if so, how should we be thinking about sea level rise and protecting the transportation infrastructure? I have no background and experience uh, with that future planning. So I would have to turn to one of our uh, transportation engineers or planners. Josh, is that something that you might respond to? based on broader city policies as well? I would say that I would like to defer to the project team in, in terms of how that's going to be incorporated into the current effort. Um, certainly is something that is on our radar or something that we're going to increasingly need to be paying attention to and particularly in an area like the Tide Flats where we're making these major investments to make sure that they can continue to serve the community um, even uh, with some of the challenges that we expect to face in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. I would just like second that, just second that and add that the, the city and the county and the port and other agencies are proactively working on this uh, jointly um, to figure out what kind of changes we need to make to infrastructure. And one of the first ones that actually does come up is stormwater. How do we manage that so that um, we, know we, we stay as clean as we can and get cleaner down the line? And then the other thing is um, the port, at, at the port, we are actually looking at this proactively right now and, and see what we can do as we uh, work on our facilities, do maintenance and make improvements to, to build increased resiliency into whatever projects we're doing. And I'm sure that it's the same for the city. Thank you. And I see Steve Atkinson has come back on, so I am, suspecting he might have some thoughts to contribute as well. Yeah, I heard, I heard Josh mention the project team, so I should just uh, <laughs> hop on here for a second. But yep. um, it, it's, it's a great question. And what I, what I can share is uh, much like Christine said in the past, really probably about three years, uh, we've been working predominantly with Washington Sea Grant, uh, NOAA, uh, Climate Impacts Group out of UW Seattle, 
uh, to really just try to get some of the most, I think, cutting edge, really uh, like sea level rise probability modeling. So we could really get better data that's more tailored to our local environment that we can use to actually start having a really meaningful conversation about what the risks and vulnerabilities are and how we start to adapt. So there's some really great work uh, online that we'd, we'd love to share with everyone. Um, also have some draft reports on our website currently uh, that kind of go through what some of the different scenarios look like. And, and then with some of the initial draft findings um, on the, the vulnerability assessments. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think for, for all these folks here, uh, some of them, you, some people may have been involved in some of those conversations, but um, a couple of years back when we'd gone through some of those initial conversations, one of the examples that came up was just the challenge of if you just took a single road through the tide flats and said, we need to raise it six or eight inches to make it more resilient uh, for flooding or flooding impacts, all of the other intersection points, uh, driveways, rail access, just the, the challenges of just saying, you know, elevation can sound really simple, but there's a lot of complexities about actually um, doing that, that work to, to raise that infrastructure. So, um, so we're, we're certainly gonna be looking at that data and then seeking some input on, on what kinds of, uh, kind of what those vulnerabilities mean for our transport. So I think for now, kind of hold tight on that, um, but we will certainly be having some more in-depth conversations around how we apply those findings to this uh, transportation network. Great, thank you, Steve. We have perhaps time for one more quick question before turning it to Steve to close out our meeting. Is there another one, Deborah, that we might pose? Marcia, this is Darren. There's a gentleman that's pu been putting questions in the Q&A. Uh, he's, he's asked three. I was wondering if uh, we could recognize him. Are you seeing that as well? Uh, the questions that, that um, have been proposed yeah. are not the questions that are in the, in the chat box I'm seeing. This hmm. one, uh, there's one. This is uh, a problem when your panelists are not diversified. Are you seeing that one? Yes, the, the, and, yeah, this, this gentleman then, has proposed okay. three questions. I wanna make sure he's recognized. Here's uh, one that I'll pose to the panel. Again, all the questions will be organizing, putting responses and, and putting them on the website. But okay. this one, this is the problem when your panelists are not diversified and inclusive of health professionals, clergy and public. What influence does the public have towards planning the Northwest planning of the Northwest Seaport Alliance besides commerce. So again, the question, this is the problem when your panelists are not diversified and inclusive of health professionals, clergy and the public. What influence does the public have towards planning of the Northwest Seaport Alliance besides commerce? Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to, to take that question. Um, the Northwest Seaport Alliance is an operating um, entity that's jointly owned by the Port of Seattle and by the Port of Tacoma. And so the strategic plans that both of those ports have um, are a major influence in, in helping guide what the Alliance does on behalf of those ports. And I would just like to point out that um, the Port of Tacoma is just in the process of finalizing it, an update to its strategic plan. Um, we've had, to the extent we could, a COVID made it a little bit more difficult to get our feet on the ground, but we've had an extensive public engagement process as part of that. Um, and um, you should look out for, or maybe that can be posted also uh, as part of this process, we're out um, or will be out very soon with a draft plan for public review and comment. And um, if I may, um, Steve, uh, obviously this process also has a very robust public and engagement component 
So any questions or concerns that, that come up as part of the process can be addressed. And I, I would just otherwise like to point out that um, these um, three visioning sessions that we're concluding with the one today were specifically designed um, to address the topics um, that um, were posed. And so um, then you, you do end up with, with folks with, with expertise in those areas. And the other point I would like to make is that obviously the Port of Tacoma is a major or if not the major landowner in, in the tide flats and as such, um, it's sort of an oversized um, impact on us uh, in terms of what, what, where we go with this process. Thank you for that. And I'll give Karen a moment and then I'm gonna turn it back to Steve to finish the meeting. So Thank you, Marcy. And um, I really appreciate the question. And I um, was really uh, nice to see that. And I would just like to add that I am a, a Tide Flats uh, advisory group um, participant. And um, I would say get involved and um, participate in the um, sessions that we have. They're all public. Um, all voices are welcome. And we want to understand uh, what your questions, concerns, and input are, uh, because everyone has valuable experience uh, to contribute here. Um, so pay attention to the website, the Tide Flats website, and then look to the events page. Uh, participate. Uh, let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, because as Steve mentioned earlier, you know this isn't a clean slate. Um, but there are a lot of voices that are being heard right now and where we're going in the future. So thank you for posing that question and get involved. So thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Steve to complete the meeting and actually say a bit more about <laughs> how to be involved. Yeah. yeah. And, and just wanted to close it. Uh, again, I really appreciate all of our panelists tonight. Uh, kind of stepping into the forum and for all the, the insights that you shared this this uh, afternoon, especially on a Saturday. Uh, so just really appreciate always the, the generosity of, of kind of giving that time um, and thought to this process. Uh, appreciate everyone in the audience that showed up today, again, on a, on a Saturday, taking time away uh, from other things that you could be doing to be here. Um, as Marcy said at the very beginning, uh, these will be recorded and shared on the website. So these are kind of intended to be Kind of uh, discussion items, you know, thought-provoking discussions that the people can can listen in on, and to really then help people think about, you know, some of their own the trade-offs or goals or vision, uh, but hopefully to learn a little bit more about what's kind of what's going on down in this area. Uh, thank you for bringing the slide back up. Um, just want, did want to take a moment. I kind of recognized a couple of the questions in the in the queue. Um, probably more kind of directed or or appropriate for the project staff. Uh, than in some cases for our panelists. I just wanted to kind of recognize um, that this is not kind of the only way to engage in the process. Uh, this is intended to be more of an informational discussion. I would really love it if everyone uh, in the audience today uh, could go to our website at tacoma.org slash tideflats, uh, take the online survey, uh, share it uh, with anyone, uh, whether it's family members, friends, uh, community groups. We do want to kind of get as broad a reach as we can. Uh, the other interesting thing I would just make note on that, um, I think I'd highlighted earlier that in the story map, there's some broad topics and you can get links to the individual baseline reports that, that kind of describe some of the existing conditions. Um, if you have comments or suggestions or things that you think are missing or that we should be uh, considering as part of those reports, uh, please feel free to, to contact me directly and share that information. Um, at the end of that survey, you'll also see a, a tab for a map uh, a map link. And so there's there's sort of some trade-offs when you're trying to provide written responses. Uh, there may be areas where you're saying, you know, restoration is a really key goal for me, or uh, multimodal transportation is a really key thing for me that I want to see completed in this area. But there may be specific locations or access points that that you think are really important to highlight or present unique opportunities. And that map function is a really great way, I think, to be able to put a, a pin on a particular site and say, in this location, there's something that is really unique or that is a really, um, you know, or this is a, a really problem site for an intersection for these reasons. There's something here that we need to, 
to fix or, or problem solve. Uh, so please feel free to use that. Again, share it broadly. Um, also, I, I guess I would just highlight that we are conducting direct outreach to different uh, boards, committees, commissions, neighborhood groups. Um, so again, please, if, if you have a group or organization that you're involved with and you'd like to help facilitate a visioning discussion and direct outreach with the project staff, uh, again, um, we will provide uh, you know, coverage to get to those meetings and help support those conversations. So again, please reach out. Uh, on April 1st, we're gonna be uh, working with uh, Lexi Brewer, who's the chair of the Sustainable Tacoma Commission on a um, visioning session with the uh, Tacoma Green Drinks. Um, and uh, so there's gonna be a lot of different opportunities like that as well. Um, so again, a couple of key things here. Uh, and then just to make note, I, I saw the question, I think from Lester in the audience as well about kind of other other comments and public, you know, uh, uh, kind of public interest that we've had over the last few years. We know we're not starting from a blank slate either in terms of our public process. So again, just wanted to make note that there's a lot of other planning efforts that have gone on. Uh, there's a lot of other kind of planning that's happening in the background, all of which had public process and public input. And those are all things that we'll be considering as part of this process as well. So even currently in the last uh, six months, the Port of Tacoma did significant survey outreach on their strategic plan. Uh, so we'll be considering the findings from that work. Uh, currently as well, if anyone's still interested in our um, uh, Office of Environmental Policy and Sustainability, has been doing significant outreach around our climate mitigation planning uh, and climate adaptation. So we know with both of those efforts that while they kind of had their own unique um, kind of take and involvement, um, that the, the questions and the findings from that input um, also apply to the tide flats. And so the lens we'll be taking is kind of reviewing that work as well and what people said through those processes. And now how do we translate that and apply it within the specific geography that we're working within? So I don't want anyone to think that we're not going to be considering uh, that input as well. Um, and so certainly if you've been involved in uh, those efforts, know that we'll be considering uh, your input here as well. Um, so with that, uh, just again, thank you all. Um, appreciate the questions, appreciate the insight and just look forward to continuing the community conversation.